grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Welcome as we gather to worship God this morning here at Park Lake. I call your attention to a variety of announcements that are printed in the bulletin. But even as I do that, I don't want to forget to remind you to take the red pads and sign those and pass them back and forth. Leave your address and email address if you can during the service so we can greet by name or drop you a note. Or if you see somebody else come in, feel free to pass that along to them as well. But there are a number of announcements. There is an insert. We're beginning to receive orders for the uh, Easter lilies, so you want to note that and begin to make your reservations for that. There's a church picnic immediately following worship service today in Langford Park, and hopefully there's an announcement about that with some more information, but everyone's invited to come join us and just enjoy being outside and being together. I was also asked to announce that blessing bags are available and I believe that they're at both the West Transept and the North X door, so feel free to pick up a blessing bag prepared by our youth and have them with you during the week and pass them out to those who you see that are in need. And also in the hymnal racks are, I believe, some offering envelopes for the mission fair. If you didn't have a chance to contribute earlier and you'd like to do so, feel free to use one of those envelopes. We have a minute for mission today from Jan Ellis, I believe. But sometimes I believe things that aren't altogether right. So, <laughs> let us prepare to worship God in a time of silent meditation.
We are called to worship. Friends of God, believe this. God loved the world. God loves the world. We are the beloved. May the truth of this great story shine through our worship today and renew our sense of calling. So come with your tiredness, your frustrations, your discouragements. Come with your doubts, your fears, your longings. Come to discover yet again how Jesus reveals God's love and mercy. We come in friendship to God and each other and in friendship to the world to listen for God's word to us, to offer our prayers and to renew our calling. Let us worship God. Let's pray. O God of Sabbath keeping, we thank you for a day that you modeled for us. For Sabbath followed six days of your work in creating this world and you rested and you have told us to do the same. In our time of gathering in this space that is set aside from any other space, we pray that you would meet us in times of quiet, in words of prayer, in reading of scripture, in singing of hymns. Meet us in those places so that we might be renewed and refreshed in your gracious spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We stand. scripture reading is from the Old Testament, from the book of Numbers, 
recounting of the journeys in the wilderness as Moses led the people from slavery in Egypt to the promised land. Chapter 21, verses 4 through 9. Listen for God's word. From Mount Hor, they set out by way to the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. But the people became impatient on the way. The people spoke against God and against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and we detest this miserable food. Then God sent poisonous snakes among the people, and they bit the people so that many Israelites died. The people came to Moses and said, We have sinned by speaking against the Lord and against you. Pray to the Lord to take away the snakes from us. So Moses prayed for the people. And the Lord said to Moses, Make a poisonous serpent and set it on a pole, and everyone who is bitten shall look at it and live. So Moses made a serpent of bronze and put it upon a pole, and whenever a serpent bit someone, that person would look at the serpent of bronze and live. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. This scripture reading has the The people of God, the Israelites, complaining against God for their wandering in the wilderness, for their their tiredness, for their hunger. And yet they realize their sin in their complaint and ask for forgiveness. And so we do, in our worship, turn to God recognizing that there are ways in which we live that are against God's plan for our lives. But God is merciful and loving and longs to forgive us. Let us confess our sins together first using the prayer of confession in our bulletin. God, our Redeemer, we confess that we are people of ashes and dust. We grumble and complain when you have provided all we need. We continue to walk in darkness when you have given us to the world. Our deeds do not match our words. We profess faith, but we practice deceit and disbelief. Forgive us, God of grace. Help us to trust in you so that we may not perish, but may have eternal life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, also hear the silent prayers of our heart. In Christ's name, amen. Friends, this is truth. Day to day, God offers us mercy and hope. Moment to moment, we are surrounded by God's never-ending love. Trust the good news for you. God takes our broken-hearted prayers and crafts them into words of grace of joy, of peace. Thanks be to God. Christ died for us. Christ arose for us. Christ reigns in power for us. Christ prays for us. Our hope is in Christ. Friends, may the peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. Will you turn and share Christ's peace with one another?
Please be seated. I invite the children who are here to join me on the steps. Yes. So I brought a map today. Do you all like maps? Anybody like maps? Do you ever look at maps? Sometimes today kind of makes me sad, but we've got, a, we've got GPSs. So we kind of put the GPS and put the address in our phones, and then we wait for somebody to say, turn right, go straight, turn left, recalculating, recalculating, recalculating. Um, so what we miss when we do that is we miss the big picture. So I always loved maps. I love looking at maps. I would, I would hand my children maps when we went on trips and tell them, now look for the next city, the next big city, and they, they would find it on the map. So um, for the most part, they know how to read a map. Um, so here I have a map. This is of the Southeast United States. So here we've got, goes up to, well, actually, I think this is bigger than Southeast. No one says so. Okay, so here I did, I put a big star right here at Orlando. This is where we are. Do you recognize the state of Florida? Yep, yes, okay. So you live here. Um, so let's say we're going on a trip. Where do you wanna go, Jonathan? You wanna go to Georgia. Do you know on this map where Georgia is? Good, good, that's right. So you look at, do you have a place in Georgia where you wanna go? No, any place? You wanna go to Atlanta? How does that sound? You wanna go to Valdosta? That's just right over the border, so that's sort of like a small commitment to Georgia. Okay, so, so say we're going to Valdosta. If I got here, I'm going to Valdosta, I want you to put your finger on where Valdosta is. Do you see that right there? Yeah, so you're going to, so you start off, you're gonna drive, right? Okay, you're not gonna walk, it's too far to walk. So we're going to, um, to Valdosta. And you get on the road and you start going down this way. Yeah? Huh. Well, do you know that's the opposite way to Valdosta? This is going that way. So you got on the road and you started going down this way, but you, you wanna go that way, right? So, um, so what would you need to do? You're right, you're right. You get down there and you turn up and you can go up 75 and get to Valdosta that way. Maybe recalculating, recalculating. So, um, so this is an interesting thing when, of course, we come here and we need to hear, you expect that I'm gonna to turn towards Jesus, don't you? Yeah, so I'm not really here about telling you how to read a map, though I think that is very interesting. What I want to, to tell you is that Jesus is sort of like a GPS or like a map. Jesus came and he said, he said, God's kingdom is here. So he's pointing us to God, you're, you're in this place and God's kingdom is coming. And um, you're going in the wrong direction. And you need to recalculate. You need to figure this out. God's kingdom is here and we start moving and we actually are turning in the wrong direction and Jesus says, recalculate, recalculate. And Jesus gives us a way to recalculate. Jesus gives us his words, he gives us his stories. God sent Jesus to help us go in the right direction because we were heading in the wrong direction and we didn't know it. So just like we want to know where to go and we consult a map if we're on a trip, if we know in our lives we are really going in the wrong direction, that we have a map that God gives us, that Jesus tells us about, to recalculate and head this way. Because God stands there welcoming us, loving us. Why would we not want to head that direction? That's what Jesus is asking us to think about. Let's have a prayer together. 
Dear God, we thank you that you come to us not, not with words that put us down, but words that are strong and loving and want to build us up. Open our ears and our hearts. Help us to recalculate so that we can head toward you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thanks for coming up today. Our gospel lesson for this morning comes from John's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 14 through 21. And this is a passage that picks up right in the middle of a longer conversation, conversation between Jesus and the Pharisee Nicodemus that begins at the beginning of the chapter when we are told that Nicodemus came to Jesus at night and asked him a question. And there's a great deal of back and forth and the majority of the story toward the end that we will pick up is Jesus talking to Dick Nicodemus and right off the bat there's a reference in what Jesus says to the passage which Helen read earlier from the Old Testament from the book of Numbers beginning in chapter 3 verse 14. And just as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, so that everyone who believes in him may not perish, but may have eternal life. Indeed, God did not send the Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. Those who believe in him are not condemned, but those who do not believe are condemned already because they have not believed in the name of this only Son of God. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world and people loved darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For all who do evil hate the light and do not come to the light, so that their deeds may not be exposed. But those who do what is true come to the light, so that it may be clearly seen that their deeds have been done in God. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God.
Our epistle lesson comes from Paul's letter to the Ephesians, chapter 2, verses 1 through 10. You were dead through the trespasses and sins in which you once lived, following the course of this world, following the ruler of the power of the air, the spirit that is now at work among those who are disobedient. All of us once lived among them in the passions of our flesh, following the desires of flesh and senses, and we were by nature children of wrath, like everyone else. But God, who is rich in mercy, out of the great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus, so that in the ages to come, he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not your own doing. It is the gift of God, not the result of works so that no one may boast. For we are what he made us, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared beforehand to be our way of life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable in thy sight. O God, who art our rock, and our Redeemer. Amen. <clears throat> 2018, this year, marks the 200th anniversary of the publication of Mary Shelley's novel, Frankenstein, also subtitled A Modern Prometheus. As some of you know, probably because I've already bored you incessantly talking about it, I've been reading a a new edition of the novel published for the 200th anniversary by the Massachusetts Institute of Technology and Arizona State University. It's an edition that's annotated for, in the publisher's words, scientists, engineers, and creators of all kinds. That means about every other paragraph, there's a little footnote you can click if you read an electronic version and go to, and one of the scientists from these two places raises issues that you can't really understand, but must be very, very fascinating. They do things like comparing Victor Frankenstein's creation to Robert Oppenheimer Oppenheimer and and his reaction after the first test of a nuclear or atomic weapon. But I'd never read the novel before, And so reading it now for the first time with all of these annotated comments by leading scientists has just captivated my interest. And then I discovered that Delaney Bookhart was reading the novel for school at the same time that I was reading it. And we started to compare our thoughts and our impressions and we we found out that we were thinking some of the same things. We were surprised at how sad the story is, almost heartrending in many ways. And we even realized that we shared a little sympathy for the creature and for all the suffering that the creature endured, even though the creature caused great suffering for Victor Frankenstein. And Kaylee and I noticed and compared notes about how the novel is in many ways a love story, or rather it's a story of what happens when the opposite of love, fear and repulsion, take love's place. And then Kaylee told me about four weeks ago that she had finished reading the novel, and I thought, wait a second, I haven't finished reading the novel. I think I've still got a lot to go, and I was trying to figure out how did she she finish it, and then I said, well, I'm reading all those annotations, all those footnotes, and the fact of the matter is I think she's just a much faster reader than I am and finished it way ahead of me. But one of the things that you realize as you read the book is how different the book is from just about all of the theatrical and movie adaptions that you really probably know better than you know the book. For instance, in all the movies that I remember, 
Victor Frankenstein is overcome with an almost rapturous joy when the experiment works and the lifeless form of the creature suddenly moves. Now, I'm sure that you all know the sound bite as Victor screams out in delightful disbelief, and I'm gonna invite you to say it along with me. Ready? One, two, three. It's alive! You remember how he screams that out in the movies? But in the book, it isn't like that at all. In the novel, Victor is terrified when he is awakened to find the creature alive and standing at the foot of his bed. And he immediately regrets the hideousness of the creature he has created and he rejects it. And from that point on, the book, it seems to me, begins to activate the questions highlighted by Victor's taking on the role of creator. Questions such as these, what is the nature of life? What does it mean to be creator? What does it mean to be creature? What does it mean to be human? Victor's achievement, without first asking and answering these questions, leads inevitably, I think, in the novel, to the destruction of life. It is an achievement that brings irony, pathos, and tragedy in its wake. So, let me ask, isn't it obvious to you how in my mind, as I was reading the gospel text from John, I could immediately make a connection with Mary Shelley's novel Frankenstein? Isn't that just obvious to you? I'm, I'm sure you're probably all saying, thank you, Dana. I'm sure you're probably all saying it's as clear as mud. Well, well, let me attempt my own tortured explanation for a moment. When we read this morning from John's gospel, as we did a, a shorter passage, we're reading a shorter passage, as obviously you, you know, of a, a longer section. And especially about that particular passage, as we read it, it's hard not to zero in on one verse. Perhaps the most famous verse in the whole Bible, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. You can't overestimate how important that verse has been for the Christian faith over the centuries, for all of us our faith, I'm sure. If I bet I were to ask you to recite one verse of the Bible, there's a good chance that immediately you would begin to recite John 3, 16. Maybe, maybe you might say another verse, perhaps one about loving God and loving your neighbor or Jesus' commandment to love one another. But, but as we thought about it a little bit together, we both probably realized that those two verses have their grounding, their affirmation in this central verse, for God so loved the world that God gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. That's, that's the Christian faith in a nutshell, wouldn't we say? That's what Martin Luther said about it. This verse, Luther said, is the gospel in miniature. But, but what happens when, as we do so often, we take just one thing and we pull it out of or we isolate it from its larger context. What happens when we disconnect one verse from the rest of the story? Because I'm sure all of you have seen John 3:16 in a variety of places and on a variety of occasions and in a variety of forms that you can hardly imagine. On coffee cups, on bumper stickers, on tattoos and all sorts of places. Needle points, neon lights. What happens when we take the verse, just even its numerical reference, and put it somewhere completely disconnected from the rest of the story? Is it possible that it can become a caricature in some ways and distort more than it reveals? And if we do that, if we take this one verse out of the larger context, and here's the move of connecting the two things. If we do that, are we kind of creating in reverse a sort of Frankenstein's creature? I was 
visiting in a home uh, not too long ago. And down in the basement of this marvelous home, uh, the father of the home had an incredible display of all kind of model trains, more than I'd ever seen in one place before. And they were all nicely displayed and aligned and affixed to beautiful shelves along the wall. Every kind of locomotive you can imagine, every kind of engine, every kind of little this and that of all sizes. It was just like a museum with all these trains there. But, but then I noticed nowhere in the whole room or the whole area where all the trains were, was there any train in operation. There was no train track set up. There was no display to show how all these marvelous model trains worked, what it was all for, how, how all the parts together could come together to, to put something that would run. And, and I asked one of his children, is there no display of the trains? And they said, no, no, dad just likes to have the train parts there up on the wall, look at them all the time. And, and to me, it just seemed like there was something lifeless in that. It was like having all, all of the parts, but missing somehow the life of what all those parts might bring as they were put together. If we take just the one verse and hold it alone out of its context, do we sort of create a, a Frankenstein's creature in reverse? Frankenstein's creature was a collection of parts that made the creature almost superhuman, and yet he lacked something central to the essence of human life. Something more than just the sum of all his parts. And the horror in the story, it seems to me, happens when human life is just a collection of parts and it's missing that central essence. Just as some kind of disruption or damage can be done if we take just one verse and lift it out of its context and disconnect it from the rest of the story because in, in both cases we're, we're missing and we're not grappling with and we're not understanding this central question of what it is that constitutes life. What, what it is that makes life what it is. And, and that, I think, moved me to my second connection and perhaps even my sermon title. Where does life come from? Mary Shelley raised that question in her novel, does life come from the ability and achievement of one scientist to put together different parts and create a living being? And that seems to me to be also the question, even as we focus on John 3:16, that is at the heart of all of John's gospel. Where does life come from? In John's gospel, from the beginning to the end, Jesus himself, Jesus' life story, answers this question. Where does life come from? From the opening words of the gospel. In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. What is coming to being in him was life. And the life was the light of all people. All the way from that beginning to perhaps what are actually the last words of the gospel in chapter 20, when the writer says, now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these words are written so that you may come to believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that through believing you may have life in his name. All the way from the beginning to the end of John's gospel, as he weaves together the story of Jesus' life, he's showing us a picture of where life comes from and what the character and the content of that life actually is. If we ask the question, where does life come from? John answers, I think, throughout his whole story, life comes from the God who loves, whose love is embodied and expressed in giving. And it is a giving love centrally revealed in the life of Jesus Christ through whom we are invited and empowered to share in the character and the content of God's love-giving life. These three words go together throughout John's gospel, love, and giving, and the life. 
And you can almost rearrange them and they come at the question from different angles. Love giving life, life giving love, giving love life. It's there John trying to show us and say to us over and over and over again, here is life. It's there in Jesus' invitation for us to share in his life. It's there in Jesus' call to us to face and make a decision about his life and what that life evokes in us, the life, the, the, the life and the choices that it evokes from us. And it's there also in Jesus' challenge for us to work and hold on to the character of life or eternal life as he calls it, to know that both here and in the hereafter. Those are the themes that are woven so tightly together, just as we almost heard it in the choir's anthem this morning, a medley of different tunes, not just John 3.16, but also beautiful Savior, and then John 3.16 again, and then Jesus paid a price, all being woven together to give us a picture that we can't see just on its own. Here is John's challenge to us. Look at this life. Be open to this life. Receive this life, which comes from the love and giving character of God. And as you are open to it, and as you receive it, and as you share in it, be aware and be active and the way that it transforms the way you are living in the world. Now that, that sounds just very abstract and hard to get your hands around and hard to get your hands onto and hold onto. But it, it became clear to me earlier this week as I was channel surfing and mentioned to some other folks, came across a special program on PBS a program celebrating the 50th anniversary of Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, a program that was titled, Mr. Rogers, It's You I Like. And, and if you watched that program, and if you were exposed again to the character and the content and the way of Fred Rogers' life, of his love for life, and especially his love for children, and his ability to share with children, his, his ability to push back the darkness and push back fear and bring the children into light and to truth, so that not only did we see them in light and truth, but they began to see the world itself in light and truth. You, you, you just began to get a picture, I think, of what John the Gospel writing, writer was talking about. In, in all the different stories that were shown from Mr. Rogers' Neighborhood, you saw it again and again and again. In, in the story of the time, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, who was a Presbyterian minister, as many of you know, and from Pennsylvania, as many of you know, how he could speak to people in a way that acknowledged them, almost cherished them, and, and lifted them up. Just as when Itzhak Perlman, the world famous violinist, was on his show and appeared, but he was shown as he appeared walking across the stage using his crutches. In a way that sort of just showed truly who he fully was. And then as he sat down, one of the first things that Fred Rogers said to him wasn't, man, you must be weak to have to use those crutches and walk across the floor. Do you remember how during Franklin Delano Roosevelt's presidency, it was never to be shown that he had polio, that he had crutches, and yet here was Fred Rogers showing and talking to Itzhak Perlman with his crutches, and Fred Rogers saying to him at the very first, wow, your arms must be really strong having to use those crutches. Is that true? Lifting him up and showing his strength and showing his ability and showing his character in so many ways. But perhaps the most moving and, and the touching of, of all the segments that were shown in the program, to me at least, was the episode when, when Fred Rogers said to the camera, I have a friend that I want to invite to my neighborhood. And, and then he called the friend into his neighborhood. And it was a little boy probably nine or 10 years old. Mr. Rogers said, I want to introduce my friend, Jeff Erlinger. 
And here came out this little boy, profoundly handicapped, unable to walk, but driving onto the set in his electric and mobilized wheelchair. And as he drove up to Fred Rogers, Fred sat down and began to talk with him. And they immediately began to talk about this chair and how fascinating it was, how amazing it was, how interesting. Where'd you get that chair? Was it hard to learn how to use it? And, and this little boy, as Fred Rogers talked to him, his face just lit up with, with the light of love and, and truth and being present in the presence of one who was sharing and giving love. Fred Rogers said to him, why, why do you have to use a wheelchair like that? Can you tell us what happened? And the little boy began to articulate clearly and plainly, well, when I was about seven months, they discovered that I had a tumor and my parents elected to have surgery for me. And in the process of the surgery, the nerves were cut, which told my, my brain used to tell my arms and legs to move to so my brain. And he just fully laid out his condition and Mr. Roger so welcomed it and he began to talk to the little boy. And then he said to the little boy, uh, there's a song I like to sing. Would you sing it with me? And Jeff said yes. And then Mr. Rogers began to sing, It's you I like. It's not the things you wear. It's not the way you do your hair. But it's you I like. And then Mr. Rogers' voice got quieter and the, Jeff's voice started to get louder. And, and you could see Jeff singing it. The way you are right now. The way deep down inside you. Not the things that hide you. Not your toys. And then they both sing together, or your fancy chair. They're just beside you. But it's you I like, every part of you, your skin, your eyes, your feelings, whether you're old or new, even when you're feeling blue, that it's you I like. It's you yourself. It's you. It's you I like. That, that story which we read from... John's Gospel, just a part of, is a story of a Pharisee, Nicodemus, coming to Jesus at night and saying to him, Rabbi, we, we know you are a teacher because you must come from God because nobody could do the good deeds you do unless you came from God. And, and then Jesus begins to talk to Nicodemus. Really, what do you know, Nicodemus? Nicodemus, what do you know? Well, did you know that to enter the kingdom of God, you have to be born again. Born again? What in the world can you talk talking about? Born, what does that mean? You have to be born from the Spirit, born above. Life has to come into you. And Jesus continues to talk to Nicodemus and begins to talk to him. And just as the sun must be lifted up for God so loved the world until at the end, you can almost hear Jesus saying to Nicodemus, Nicodemus, come out of the dark. Come into the light. Share in this life. Listen to the word of God for you. Be renewed in your life. Nicodemus, Nicodemus. There's a commercial I've seen on TV a few times recently. Did you know that this was the 50th anniversary of the first heart transplant? done at Stanford University. And in this commercial, which is a commercial by a pharmaceutical company which makes drugs to help organs not reject, transplant, and that kind of thing, there's a woman named Roxine, and, and she's talking about how surprised she was to find out she would have to have a heart transplant, and some of the things that she was worried about, how she shouldn't have been worried, and it cuts back and forth with all the doctors saying, we're so excited about all the medical achievements we've made, all the progress, all that drugs can do now, and all that good's being done. And it's a commercial which is lifting up the significance of this work, significance of this achievement, the, the life that has been given to people who, who receive transplants. And then at the end of it, Roxine, the, the recipient of the heart transplant, she says, you know, the mother of the donor said to me, you were meant to carry my son's story in you. 
For God so loved the world. You were meant to carry that story in you. Amen. Let us affirm what we believe by reciting together the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence you shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Let's pray. Holy and gracious God, you sing us a love song to wake us up. Though we may have forgotten, we were lifeless forms until you breathed life in us. We have boldly, or some of us resolutely, embraced life as our own to figure out, and yet you lovingly and patiently come to us again and again and again and finally in Jesus to show us love's way. May we believe that we are that loved, and may we believe that in you we are whole. When there are trials in our lives, the suffering and the sorrow, the challenges and struggles, when we are tired, when all we want to do is complain, remind us that we are loved, that we are yours. We pray that you would be with those who weep and cannot sleep, for those who have no peace, for those who seek to let go, may they find healing comfort in you, in believing, in being loved. We pray that you would lead us with grace and with love and with peace, that you would fill us with hope and with patience and with stamina that you would transform us in your image, in your Son, and in your name, to grow and to understand and to see that we can be made whole, and that in wholeness, we can believe and be loved and be well. Hear us, O oh God, for we need your guidance, we need your healing. Hear us as we continue to pray words that have been given to us by the first disciples as we pray the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our worship continues as we present to God our tithes and our offerings.
try to live this week without the truth of the gospel that ties it all together. For God so loved the world, this is the story you carry in you. And now may the love of God and the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit guide and keep you all now and forevermore. Amen.